Man, whether you have been a part of the Forum family for years, or if this is your first Sunday here, we just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here. You're in good company, and we welcome you with, with open arms. There's a place for you here. Um, while we are getting started, though, if you all could do us all a favor, and if you could scoot to the right in your row, this 10 o'clock service just ends up filling up super quick, and we've actually had multiple weeks in a row where there haven't been enough seats for people in the auditorium, which is a, a thing, good and bad, right, and all the things. But you can help by moving to the right in your row. That'll just open up all those available seats on the left, make it easy for people as they file in to find a place. Awesome. While we're on the announcement train, I want to tell you and remind you about two events that we have happening today. The first one is the Connect event. And this event is more for those of you who might be new or visiting Forum. We have Connect events about every two months. And it's an opportunity for you to sit around tables with ministry leaders at Forum and learn more about Forum and just ask questions about our, our doctrines and core beliefs or um, how you can get connected. And there is a meal and it is wonderful. So if you are interested in that, it is not too late. Even if you didn't sign up, we got some extra food and extra chairs for you. So you will come today during the 1130 service in room 200, which is down this adult classroom hallway. We would love to see you there. And the second one I want to remind you of is our annual membership meeting. That event is happening also today, but at 1 p.m. here in the auditorium. That's an opportunity where we are going to ordain our new elder and deacons. Bradley Williams is going to share a snapshot of the health of a forum as a ministry as a whole. And then there'll be a Q&R time at the end where you can ask any questions you might have about forum as a ministry. So if either one of those events interests you, feel free to show up today. No sign up required. Awesome. Now, would you all stand if you are able and just find somebody around you that maybe you don't know super well and say, hey, I'm so glad that you're here and introduce yourself. Join me in, pray, in prayer as we pray together. Oh, Father, you are here with us, and you are good, and in you we have everything that we need. Your nature is unchanging, and so we can trust that you are faithful, and you are good, and you are over all things, because you are almighty God. And we have come today not to perform for you, we have not come to be entertained, but we have come to give you praise, to lift your name high, and to receive from you whatever it is that you have for us. We open ourselves to you, Lord, and ask that you would speak and you would move, and by the work of your spirit that we would leave this place today changed, transformed by the work of your spirit. We want to be more and more like Jesus, and so we ask that you would do that work. As we look back on the landscape of our lives, we can see all of the ways that you have been at work, all the ways that you have been present and faithful, and we say thank you. And so in this moment, we recenter our scattered senses from the busyness of this week, all the things on our to-do list, all the burdens that we have carried, we lay them at your feet, and we center and focus on you, the only one who is worthy of our praise. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's worship him together. When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You were there and you're here right now. In every high and every low, you never left me without hope. 
Good morning, everyone. Man, I love that commercial, uh, the finale of that commercial, uh, because it marks the end of uh, a really impactful series, and it's been our prayer. Not only does it mark the end of a series, but maybe a new beginning for us as we choose to live with Jesus, where we are no longer listening to and following the path that is wide and broad Uh, that leads to destruction, where life is all about what's in it for me, but instead we are living according to the narrow path of Jesus where we can find life. And we can know which path we're on when we look at the side effects of each path. And so this series has been a, a really intense look at the side effects of the narrow path of Jesus so that we can know who we're supposed to be as his followers. And as his followers, we have an identity of being forgiven and forgiving others. We live with this eternal perspective focused on the person of Jesus who calls us his child. And we live in that blessing by obeying his commands to love others the way that he loved others. And last week, we kind of hit on uh, what that love looks like and that it uh, invites others in, it walks towards the mess, and it is sacrificial in nature, not self-serving. And so today we're going to continue in that theme where we are looking at how to practically live out the love of Jesus. And this love of Jesus is always for the sake of others. If we look through the life and ministry of Jesus— He always had his ears open and his eyes open to the needs of those around him, not to serve himself in any way, but it was always for the other person. And we are called to live in that same love. And so as we dig into this idea of loving for the sake of others, what it is and how we can do it, uh, we're going to follow this roadmap uh, where we are going to look at a clarification Uh, of what loving for the sake of others is not, so that we can know which path we're on. Uh, We're going to look at a warning from Jesus that's kind of like a flashing billboard by the side of the road that, again, is going to show us um, what's going on inside of us and if we're on the path of Jesus or the path that leads to destruction. And in these clarification and warning, we get to meet Jesus who invites us into his mission for our lives, because we have a purpose from Jesus. And before we, we really dig into these, I mean, if I could be honest with you, um, this sermon is really difficult uh, for me. As I've been wrestling through this and through Jesus' ministry and his teaching on this subject, it has revealed uh, so, so many places that I didn't know were there, and that God is really wrestling with me and pouring into me. And so I don't come to you as an expert in this at all. Um, but man, God has been really good to show me what this is like. And it's my prayer that through him wrestling my own selfish desires, uh, that you can gain something too. And so if you, um, man, if you would join me, in praying, I think that would be super helpful for us. Jesus, we know that you are here. We know that you are speaking. 
And God, I pray that you would melt away all the distractions, all the plans that we have, all the things going through our mind. God, that you would melt those away so that we could sit before you and hear what you have to say. Father, we are listening. Amen. I think uh, when we think of that idea of for the sake of others, we naturally drift into serving and helping others, maybe when they're in need, or giving an encouraging word whenever someone's down, or giving gifts to people, or maybe even giving financially. And those are really like good things. Those are ways that we can love sacrificially. Yes. But I wonder when many of us are doing these for the sake of others things, I wonder if it's possible that we could actually be walking away from Jesus rather than following him. I wonder if it's possible to do the things of Jesus and say the things of Jesus and be led away from Jesus. We can do for the sake of others things, and it can look on the outside like we're doing what Jesus says and we're, we're following him. But I think it's possible that when we're convinced we're following him, we could actually be walking away from him. How would we know if that's happening to us? What I want to do in these first two sections of of clarification and warning is bring us to a place where we can see which path we're on. And I think the way we can decide and decipher which path we're on is it all comes down to our motivations, our intentions for why we're doing these for the sake of others things. And so this question is going to be driving us uh, most of the morning is, what is my motivation? What is my motivation for doing these for the sake of others' things? And so as we clarify what for the sake of others is not, and as we look at a warning from Jesus when our motivations are misguided, man, God is going to meet us in that place. Uh, to bring goodness and mercy uh, because he is good and we can then align with God's mission. But first, what, what is my motivation? Let's bring some clarity to being able to find out what our motivation is. This is our first section. It's going to help us decide which path we're on. So let's look at what love is not. Loving it for the sake of others. What is that? What is it not? Well, first, love is not for the sake of others' approval. I think this goes against uh, everything that we've been taught since we were kids. We live in a performance-based culture where if you work hard, you, do, you follow the rules, and you have a good attitude, you are rewarded. You are maybe even praised by others. The better you perform, the more opportunity you're given. The more you work, the more you receive. And the higher you go up up the proverbial ladder in whatever area you're in, the more people recognize you. And now, none of that is inherently bad, but I think it's so saturated in our culture that it's leaked into how we live out our faith. Where Where we begin serving and loving and giving in order to be noticed, in order to be praised. And it's something that we... We desperately want because maybe our self-image is, is lacking. And so we turn to the, the approval of others to define who we are and what we do, why we do what we do, and why we say what we say. This is, this is not for the sake of others. This is not loving for the sake of others. This is not what motivated Jesus. This is a, this is a twisting, it's a deception of our enemy because we could be doing the things of Jesus and saying the things of Jesus and be led away from Jesus all at the same time. Because what others begin to think of us is, be, is what we begin to think of us. 
And that is, that is a deception of the enemy. When we look at the life of Jesus, though, I mean, in Mark chapter 1, he begins this pattern of regularly leaving adoring crowds. They're after Jesus to try to get more of Jesus and, be t- and spend more time with him. And what does he do in Mark chapter 1? He's like, see a crowd, we're going to another place. He, he starts this pattern of leaving adoring crowds. And in Mark chapter 3, with his, his own family, Jesus is more concerned with the will of his father than the desires of his family. And so love is not for the sake of your family's approval. It's for others. It's, it's based on the father's love. And in John chapter 19, when his life literally depended on the approval of somebody, Pilate, did Jesus try to convince him of anything? No. Because his love was not for himself. It was always for the sake of others. Love is not for the sake of others' approval. You could be doing the things of Jesus and saying the things of Jesus, but it's not following Jesus if you are at the center. Love is also not what I can get from others. Again, this goes against everything that the culture says. Because the culture preaches and stresses scarcity where there's only so much to go around. There's only so much time. There's only so much resources. And so there's only room in our life for the people who can get us where we want to go, make us look good, and make us feel good. That is not love. And I think if, as I was reflecting and, and seeing myself in this section, I just had some questions that came to mind that I think would really be helpful in uh, clarifying our motivations. So think about these questions. Do, do you serve in order to look good on an application or a resume or a scholarship? Do you serve your spouse expecting them to give you what you want in return? Maybe you do a few extra chores this afternoon so that you can just sit and watch a game. Do do you serve out of a sense of of guilt or obligation where you're hoping to gain some sort of inner peace uh, from the serving and the loving others? Do you serve and give, and then feel like you deserve to be rewarded or that you deserve a break? Are you following Jesus for what he will bless you with in return? This is not the love of Jesus. This is extortion. And so many of us fall into this trap where ourselves are still at the center of what we do, trying to gain something in return from others. On the outside, it looks like we're doing the things of Jesus and we're saying the things of Jesus, but really the devil is at the center of all of it, where we are trying to get our way or get something in return. Love is not for the sake of what others can give me or what I can get out of it, and love is not for the sake of others when I have time or when my finances are figured out, or when my schedule slows down a little bit, or love is not for the sake of others when my kid's sports season is over. Love is not for the sake of others when it's convenient. That is not love. There are conditions on that love. That is not love according to Jesus, and it is not for the sake of others. There is no condition for the love of Jesus. And as his followers, we are called to love with no condition. It doesn't matter our bank account. It doesn't matter our schedule. It doesn't matter all of our commitments. We are called to love with no condition. And it brings us to a question back to the motivations. Does our life communicate that our time is more important to us than obedience to our king. Is your life saying that your time is more valuable than your obedience to your king? 
Man, may we never be so bold to say that our schedule and commitments are more important than loving others the way Jesus did. What is your motivation? Jesus, uh, in this place, (laughs) gets harder. Sorry. He comes into that place. um, Two things. Uh, Comes with a warning. Ah, that it is so, 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 so important to clarify our motivation. Because if we don't and we just keep going the way we're going, Jesus says, what sorrow awaits. Now think back and what you know about Jesus and his interactions with people. Who were the, the groups of people that he was the harshest with? It was the Pharisees and religious leaders. Yes. Why? Because on the outside, man, they were doing the things of God and they were saying the things of God for sure, but they were far from him. He has a warning for us to get to the place where we can label our motivation. So this is what he says to the, to the Pharisees and religious leaders in Matthew chapter 23. He says, what sorrow awaits, what judgment awaits, you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, For you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence, full of what I can get out of it. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits, you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people. You're doing the things of God and you're saying the things of God, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Is it possible to do the things of God and say the things of God, but be led away from God? Yes, <laughs> Anyone can do good things. Anyone can say good things. But Jesus says it's the motivation, it's the place from which we do those things that matters. He has an intense warning when there is a gap between who we are on the outside and who we are on the inside. He has a major warning when there is a big difference between who we are in public and who we are in private. He warns against a lack of integration between what we know Pharisees knew it all. He said, when there's a difference between what we know and how we show love to others, what sorrow awaits? He calls us hypocrites. And in verse 15 of chapter 23, calls us children of hell. I am not an expert. It is so important to be able to see why we do what we do. Because that will tell us which path we're on. We've got to be able to ask ourselves and answer the question, what is our motivation for loving others? man, what is so good about our God is that he is not judge alone. Man, he meets us in these places of confession and conviction with such gentleness. (laughs) Man, it just needs to wash over us. I think so many of us see God in an inaccurate view as judge alone, an authoritative judge alone. But he meets us there. He says things like Micah chapter 7 that I want to read over, to, read over you and read to myself in this moment. 
God, where is another God like you? He pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people. You will not stay angry with your people forever. Because listen to this. You delight in showing unfailing love. And over and over and over again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestors long ago. Jesus meets us in these places where he pulls back the curtain in our hearts and we see a whole lot of stuff. (laughs) He meets us there and he says, you are forgiven. The side effect of following me is you are forgiven. You are mine. I want you with me. You are loved beyond measure. And I am with you. This is the God we serve. And this God is meeting us in this moment to call us out of this transactional sort of love where we ask what's in it for us and what can I gain from it. And he calls us into a relational love where it is more about the person you are with than the things you are doing. This sort of relational love is something Jesus lived out and calls us to live out too. But man, how do, how do we do this? How do we go from this, this transactional love to a relational kind of love? And thinking about this question, I don't really like this question. Because I think what it's doing is actually just perpetuating this transactional love to where God, just tell me what to do so I can know I'm doing it right. Show me what to do so that I can be okay with myself. I don't like that question. I think that's a transactional kind of question. I think the better question, the more relational Jesus kind of question is who do we love? I think when we're focused on the who more than the how, we will naturally become more relational in our love. Our love will shift from what's in it for me to for the sake of others. This is what Jesus is calling us into. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. We're going to get practical, yes. But this is driving it. It's not a transactional, let me know what to do, give me more information. It's it's all about the people. Because I think if we just did all information, a lot of us would forget about it around 5.30 when a certain game starts tonight. And so this is the question. It's all about who. Who do we love? Who do we love? Um, And so in order to answer that question, in order to align with our mission that we have from God, um, we need to ask, who did Jesus love? Because that's who we're following. That's who we're called to be, is Jesus to people. So who did Jesus love? Uh, The answer to that is Jesus loved everybody all the time, all throughout Scripture. Well, that's not super helpful. And so we're going to, we're going to focus on three, three groups of people that Jesus loved. We're going to get some practical stuff. But remember, it's all about relational love, not transactional love. It's all about our motivation. It's all about the person. So the first group of, of people that Jesus loved was his neighbors. And when I say neighbors, uh, I mean people in close uh, proximity to him. And we could go, I mean, throughout the whole Gospels, uh, all four of them, and make an exhaustive list of like who Jesus interacted with and how he showed love to them. Um, But maybe that's a good thing for you to do in your personal time with him or maybe in your community um, to go through the Gospel of just Luke. Just go through Luke and make a list of who he interacted with 
uh, and that could help us um, even more. But I, I just want to look at one kind of neighbor that Jesus loved that I think um, hits at and gets us to a place where we can examine what our motivation is. Are we for the sake of others or are we for ourselves? And I think these kind of neighbors show that uh, in annoying ways. Um, it's the interrupting neighbors that Jesus loved. Think, put yourself in Jesus' shoes, if that's possible. Um, he's the most important person ever, on the most important mission ever, with the most stress ever, because it's the most important mission ever. Of all people in history, like Jesus is the one. He's the one who could ignore people or say no to people, but he didn't. If you look throughout the ministry of Jesus, did Jesus ever seem interrupted? No. Why? Because his love was always for the sake of others. And so I want to go to one passage, Luke chapter 8. It's a pretty uh, well-known interruption. If you have a Bible, turn there with me. Luke chapter 8. Hmm. He loved his interrupting neighbors. Starting in verse 40. It says, On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. And then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him because his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with, with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Notice the question. Who touched me? He didn't ask what happened, as if his own interests or his own schedule was driving his actions. He was not about the transactional doing things so that he could go to places on time and, and, and get something in return. Jesus was not transactional. He was always relational. He did not ask what happened to me. He said, who touched me? Continuing in verse 45. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd's pressing up against you. But Jesus said, no. Someone. Someone deliberately touched me. For I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell at her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Notice he doesn't say, you're welcome. It says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Notice... He wasn't expecting anything from her. Notice he didn't care what the crowds were thinking. Notice he didn't hold so tightly to his schedule to heal a dying little girl. He didn't hold so tightly to his own interests that he missed an opportunity to love. He loved even his interrupting neighbors. Man, what is, what is our reaction when we are interrupted? Yes, I say go away. <laughs> Man, when it's the end of a game and there's big plays about to happen and my kid comes up asking me a question, I say go away. <laughs> when I have a big project due that other people are depending on me for and someone interrupts me, I say sorry, I don't have time. When I am on my way to an important meeting, and I see someone on the side of the road who needs help, I say, ah, I don't really know that much anyway about cars, so someone else will help them. How do you respond when you are interrupted? It reveals our motivations. Are we for ourselves or are we for the sake of others? 
Who else did Jesus love? Man, he loved the kingdom. I think that may be the most obvious statement ever said from this platform. But Jesus loved his kingdom. He loved the church. Everything he did was to pour into and teach and love the church. Again, we could do an exhaustive list of all the ways that Jesus loved and talked about and poured into the kingdom. Maybe it's after you finish Luke, looking at all the people Jesus loved. Maybe you could go through Matthew and look at all the different references to the kingdom there. And that can tell us more ways that we can love the kingdom. Uh, But let's look at one again. Jesus loved the future of the kingdom. He was always pouring into, he was always teaching, he was always leading others along. I think one of the, one of the places we can look, it's Matthew chapter 19. If you have, go ahead and turn with me there to Matthew chapter 19. We'll look at a way that Jesus loved the future of the kingdom. Just one of many, many examples that he loved the future of the kingdom. Matthew 19, starting in verse 13. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. What's another word for bothering? Interrupting. Do you know who this is? Do you know what he's here to do? Go away. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Jesus loved spending time with and blessing kids. He could have spent all of his time talking to the Pharisees and religious leaders who were more Uh, more similar in uh, intellect and knowledge of the Bible, but instead he poured into those who were less mature. We are called to be like Jesus. We are called to love the kingdom. We are called to love the future of the kingdom. Our mission is to do this, to love the church. And I just wonder, like, I mean, who are you, who are you pouring into Maybe you come every single week and you fill your head with knowledge, but maybe there's somebody who needs you. Maybe there's someone who needs you to walk with them. Because you have unique experiences and a unique gifting from God to be able to lead others along. How are you loving the future of the kingdom? I think that will help reveal our motivations uh, in a very clear way. Finally, Jesus, he loved the nations. He loved the nations. He loved the entire world. It didn't matter what they looked like or where they came from. Jesus showed love to them. Uh, And so let's look at an example in Scripture. Turn over, if you're still in Matthew 19, Turn over just a few pages to Matthew chapter 28. These are Jesus' final words before he ascends into heaven. So they must be really important. And these might be really familiar words to us. But honestly, (laughs) we're not super good at doing it. Let's read Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, so we better pay attention. Go and make disciples. Love the kingdom well by making disciples. Love the future of the kingdom well. Make the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples Pour into them. Teach them to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is who we are called to be. We are called to love the nations 
not just those who look like us, dress like us, worship like us. We are called to love the nations. But what does this look like? Uh, maybe, maybe you have a family. Maybe you're young. Maybe you're advanced in years. What does this look like to love the nations? Well, I want to I want to try to get practical with you. There, um, we live in a town with a university in it. And people from all over, the, all over the globe come here to learn for a time. Individuals, families. Maybe you've heard this statistic. But 75 to 80% of those from overseas who come to America to learn 75 to 80% of them never step foot in a home of an American, let alone a Christian. So maybe you're young, maybe you have a family, maybe you're advanced in years. Maybe what they need is a relational kind of love where you don't add anything to your schedule, you just invite them into the things you're already doing. And that's one practical thing we could do. I think no matter what stage of life we're in, it's not about what we have or what we don't have. It's all about the person. It's all about loving for the sake of others. Another way that we can love the nations is for us to continue to support and partner with Forum as we, as a, as a ministry, partner with and support the nations. There's a a section on a map known as the 1040 window. It's based on uh, 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north latitude. And it's in this area of the world known as the 1040 window where 97% of the world's unreached people groups, those are the people who have never heard about Jesus and don't have a way to respond to Jesus, 97% of those groups live in this window. You would think for churches maybe like right in this area that this would be a really big focus, this area, this 1040 window. But on average, the church in America gives 1% to 2% of missions giving toward the 1040 window toward reaching those who are lost. That's not 1% to 2% of the whole church budget. That's 1% to 2% of missions budgets. Now, the average church in America gives uh, a little bit less than 10% of their whole budget towards missions. And it's 1% to 2% of that budget. How is Forum doing? We, if if you uh, come back for the annual meeting later today, you'll find out that we have... We have a designated firm boundary that we are giving at least 16% of our budget towards missions. Now, in that 16%, we support 33 different missionaries and organizations across the world. Of those 33 missionaries and organizations, 22 of them work directly in the 1040 window or help support those who work directly in the 1040 window. This is a practical way that we can continue to support and love the nations. So keep it up. Another way, I think most importantly, and then we'll close, another way, the most important way that we can love the nations well is through praying for the nations. Jesus says that, man, the harvest is so plentiful, but the workers are few. We can pray No matter who you are, no matter your stage of life, you can pray. And what you can do is download an app called the Joshua Project. What it does is it gives uh, an unreached people group for the day that you pray for. It gives a picture of someone from that culture, from that group. It gives some general facts about their culture and their spiritual beliefs. And it gives some specific ways that you can pray uh, for Christians in the area or just simply for 
the people. My two sons and I, they're seven and five, so if they can do it, you can do it. We use this, this Joshua Project app every single night, and we pray for the unreached people in the world. Because what we have as Christians, as the church, as the kingdom, is the hope and the love and the community that everyone is desperate for. We should no longer be holding it to ourselves. We should be those who love our neighbors, who love the kingdom, and who love the nations well, because that's who Jesus was, that's who he is, and that's who he calls us to be as well. These are the side effects of following Jesus. I say it's time we're done following and listening to the broad path that leads to destruction, so done with it that we push it off a roof, and we start following Jesus. That's the path to life. Who are you following? What is your motivation? Let it be for the sake of others. Let's pray. Father, you are holy. You are above us in every way. Father, forgive us for when we sit on your throne where we make life and loving and serving and giving really all about what we could get from it. God, meet us in that place of, of repentance and shower us with your mercy, your unfailing love, so that we can become aligned with your mission to love our neighbors, love those who are close to us, God, so we can love the future of the kingdom, that we can, can give what we've been given. God, that we could love the nations as you do. God, turn any shame and guilt into love and purpose and forgiveness and mercy and grace. That's who you are. God, I pray we can build our life on that, not on what we can do our own. You're good, Father. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand with us once again as we sing that he is holy and he is worthy of our praise.
may be seated. Is there, a, is there an aspect of Jesus that just blows your mind? I mean, I, I know it's Jesus. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a, a poorly worded question. But is there some aspect of Jesus, his life, his love, that just causes you to pause? Fills you with awe. I think for me, it's his interruptibility. Not entirely sure that that is a real word, but we're gonna go with it today. <laughs> his willingness to be interrupted and the way he responds with, with kindness and patience and compassion. To be completely honest, I think he just sets the bar incredibly too high for what it means to live for the sake of others. As I see his kindness toward those who continue to reject him time and time again. I see the attention that he gives those that were outcast, that were forgotten, cast aside by a society. I see the fact that he willingly subjected himself to humiliation and torture and death on a cross to save sinners like you and me. And to that, all that I can say is thank you, God, for the love of Jesus. Amen? It is good news. That's the example that we have set for us of what it means to live in love for the sake of others. So as we now gather around the communion table, the bread and the juice that we hold in our hands, it reminds us of that perfect love that we have received. And so we respond by, by giving thanks, by expressing our heartfelt gratitude. But it is also an invitation for us as his people, as followers of Jesus, to see the people that he loved, the interrupting neighbors, those that are difficult to love, the forgotten, the ones that have been cast aside, and for us to then step out in faith to be willing to be uncomfortable, to follow the leading of the Spirit and to love them the way that the Father loves them. So as we take some time now, I encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer. Ask Him what that looks like for you. What does that next step of obedience look like for you in your love of those around you? 
And then as you feel led, take the bread and the juice. If you're able, would you stand with us as we lift our voices once again to give praise to the Lord? We're creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from north to south. And east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. Be magnified 
side, Lord. Before you go, we have one last word. Go from here as witnesses of what you have seen and heard. Share God's love with those you meet. Bring hope to those who are in despair. Live lives of gratitude and praise. And may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit be within you and among you until we meet again. Amen. Have a blessed week.